Hello and welcome to the Hearing. I'm John. And from Chicago's North Side, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, um, forgot to mention this off air. Um, and this is something I, I forgot to mention last week. Um, I was doing a little reading up on Doctor My Own Patients uh, by um, uh, can't think of his name. Getty? Saturn Getty and Sickerman that we re- reviewed at the last album of last year. Um, particularly looking through the lyrics of uh, Impressa Girl. <laughs> the, the Madeline Kahn reference is a reference to a Michelob commercial she did in the late 80s. What? Where she was laying on a couch talking about having it all. He's referencing a late 80s Michelob commercial. Michelob <laughs> mob Madeline Kahn. That, you know. Oh my god. I completely do not remember a Madeline Kahn Michelob episode. Nor do I, but I've seen it on YouTube and yeah, it, that's it matches perfectly. That's what he was referencing. Oh my god. So you were kind of right. His references um, are just insane. <laughs> also, I was thinking about the album. I think it might be a concept album. Really? It, well, because we start with, you know, Boy, I'm Crazy for You, Impress a Girl. We move on to something like, you know, Don't Touch Me, I'm a Married Man. I forget the exact line. And then... Oh, it was like a reference to the Hall & Oates Family Man yeah, yeah. song. And then, you know, I'm a Married Man, and then I thought we'd have a happy life. You know, something happening in a hotel room. I think it's the beginning and ending of a relationship. Wow. I, th- I have to go through it more thoroughly, but I think it all connects. It, it wouldn't surprise me if he did do something like that, since, you know, he likes telling stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And now on to this week's album, which is from 1983, the infamous End the Unknown by Bad Religion. <laughs> Bad Religion is an American punk rock band best known for their politically and socially conscious lyrics, their melodic sensibilities, and their extensive use of vocal harmonies. Into Into the Unknown is the band's second studio album, and it was quite a departure for them. Yeah. (laughs) Characterized as a terrible misstep by Bad Religion guitarist Brett Gerwitz, it in part led to the band breaking up shortly after its release (laughs) until 85 when they reformed. (laughs) The album is oh, characterized funny. by slower tempos, use of keyboards, uh, and, and prog influenced and a prog influenced hard rock sound instead of the hardcore punk that the band was and is now still known for. It includes Bad Religion's longest track to date, "Time and Disregard," which is seven minutes long, and is the only and it's the only album Bad Religion album I think only album period to feature bassist Paul Dodona uh, and drummer Davey Goldman. Um, as Jay, Jay Bentley and Pete Finestone had left the band before the album was recorded due to the change in their sound and didn't return <laughs> until eight, the 86 EP Back to the Known. Into the Unknown was released on November 30th, 83 on Epitaph Records, produced by Greg Graffin and Beck, Brett Gerwitz, and features Greg Graffin on lead vocals, keyboards, acoustic guitar, and backing vocals, Brett Gerwitz on electric and acoustic guitars and backing vocals, Paul Dodona on bass, and Davey Goldman on drums and wood block. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at John Scotto, you'll find, link, find a link to Unto the Unknown on YouTube, because that's the only place you can find it. <laughs> so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one. It's only over when. I just this is an album that has grown on me over the years. I will say that. Um, love the the keyboard sound. It's like a cheesy eighties Casio. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and the harmonies and melody are actually very bad religion. A lot of yes. the album, if you take out the keyboards and speed it up, it sounds like bad religion. I mean, the keyboards though are real hard to get around oh, yeah, i mean yeah. they're they are just like nails on a chalkboard and, but, and they kind of repeat the sound a few yeah, yeah. times in the album oh, yeah. too um um graffin was really enamored with his synthesizer at the time um, <laughs> I, it's a lot like saturday morning cartoon themes mm-hmm. yeah um even of the time like especially at the time i mean graffin was 19 when they recorded this and gerwitz was 21 and it wow. sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, it was not, I'm not familiar with the, the pre-86 or 85 Bad Religion, honestly. I went through their first five or six albums, six if you count the EP. Um, and this is going to be a very controversial statement. 
I think this was a big step in the development of the classic Bad Religion sound. Uh, that, you know, that, that I think rings true. I mean, obviously, it's it, they had, it was a step they needed to take for de- to develop. Because How Can Hell Be Any Worse, their first album, is really just, I mean, there are inklings of what they were going to sound like, but most of it is just very straightforward, kind of DK-influenced punk. Yeah. Um, and then we get this, and then back to the known, we start getting those melodic hooks and, you know, those you know, little traces of what they do melodically. Um, Suffer, their next full album, we start getting the oohs and ahs. Uh, no control, they develop the oohs and ahs and really develop their, their sound. And then it's um, Against the Grain, which is fucking the classic, seminal Bad Religion album. Yeah. So I think this was a big and necessary stepping stone as unusual, you know, as, I mean, this is an insane, no fucks given, probably chemical driven experiment. <laughs> um, the f- back to It's Only Over When, the keyboard solo after verse one starts off sounding a lot like the riff from Hot Stuff by Donna Summer. <laughs> notes was, well, at least they... they... So plays keyboard just as good as John Paul Jones. <laughs> John Paul Jones is actually a decent keyboard player. He just didn't have a chance, much <laughs> you, of a chance. Um, you've said that, but I don't believe you. <laughs> well, you got to hear something like No Quarter or um, Trampled I, Underfoot. I mean, those I've are good heard, keyboard players. Yeah. Um, anyway, but it, it that melody, when he starts that first keyboard solo, it's almost identical to The Hot Stuff by Donna Summer. I got a big I, kick out of that. Yes. Um, the second exactly solo is what it is. second solo is better. I love the kind of chaotic, chaotic solo at the end. Um, oh, definitely. The, the The album is at its strongest when they are going for chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, when they are doing the you know <laughs> whatever that is in the Donna <laughs> Summer thing, no. <laughs> and the thing is, both Crawford and Gerberts are prog heads. Yeah, I mean yeah, that's not a surprise. They've quoted King Crimson in, in Digital Boy. Right. Um, so I think this was their attempt to make a prog album, but this is what they thought was prog. <laughs> um, on his track two, Chasing the Wild Goose, the beginning has a bit of a Ziggy Stardust vibe to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a huge Bowie influence in this album. Mm. Um, love the kind of squeaky guitar tone. The lyrics are, I'm, I'm going to say, refreshingly juvenile. Well, the lyrics kind of help this out. Without it, I'm not sure if any of it works. But yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of it's a very you know they're very simple lyrics. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Graffin was an amazing lyricist. He's a huge influence on me. But you know, at this stage, he was clearly a teenager. This is high school music. Yeah, this is like tip, typical high school band music in a lot of ways. Um. And I kind of love that this they had to go through this phase publicly to develop their their you know sound that really set them apart. Um, also, really impressed by Davey Goldman on this one, the drummer. He he kind of st- he really stands out in a couple spots on the album. Um, Is this the one where they do the cowbell in the beginning? <laughs> it's not a cowbell; it's a wood block. Okay. Yeah, this is the wood block along with that really kind of squeaky guitar sound. <laughs> On to track three, Billy Gnosis. This is my favorite. It's just hilariously cheesy and juvenile. Um, They're doing Steve Miller. It, somebody else said that in the comments. Um, I love the nice. Oh, it's take the money and run. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, nice catchy melody. There's a keyboard show right after the chorus that reminds me of Feel Us Like the First Time by Farner. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then there's the line. And I'm pulling this from Billy Gnosis, not Pink Floyd, and the worms ate into his brain. That has to be a wall reference, though. Oh, I, I, of I course, mean, pulled it, too. They quoted Crimson in 21st Digital Boy, 1st, first Century Digital Boy. Of course, they're quoting Floyd here. Um, you know, I have but secret yeah. prog heads revealed. <laughs> um, that, that breakdown is just really cringy. I think that's what you're talking about, the foreigner mm-hmm. sounding breakdown. Yeah. There's just this, right after the chorus, there's this keyboard trill that is straight out of feels like the first time um i do like the piano part as cheesy as the synth parts can get i do like uh graphic on piano very true the piano parts are good 
and then this song the the end the get the the drumming and mm-hmm. the guitar playing is just yeah. phenomenal here right there it, it ends with what is probably the longest guitar solo in bad religion history <laughs> because they flat out said their their attitude for guitar solos is they're just there to give graf a break on stage <laughs> They don't really care what the solo is. And so to hear Gerwitz just go off for a good solid couple of minutes was fascinating. I read that they did this to give um, Goldman a break okay. on uh, drums, like to to like to do have some slow songs in the repertoire. So he wasn't just, you know, beating away a mile a minute mm. for an entire show. Um, I couldn't find anything about Goldman. I did find an interview with Paul Dodona, um, that was a recent one. Um, he said that he was playing in. in, in Gerwitz knew the the singer of the band he was playing in at the time. That's how he got involved. Um, they met at a party. He, uh, the singer told him, "You know, Brett wants you to play on their next album." The whole thing it took for took about eight weeks, and he never saw Ger or I think eight. I think it was eight weeks, and then he never saw Gerwitz again. <laughs> like um you know they rehearsed for a couple of gigs that never happened and that was it and I'm then he was told the band split weeks, honestly hmm? i'm amazed this took eight weeks honestly yeah um on to track four time and disregard definitely the <sighs> longest song in bad religion history <laughs> and way too fucking long this is my pick for weakest <laughs> oh man and that's a that's a tough uh that's a tough deal. I don't want my bad religion sounding like Led Zeppelin. I discovered. I didn't know that <laughs> until this, this album. Is, this is their folky side coming out. Um, it, there's a keyboard solo we really could have lived without too. It's where I think it's, it's actually where I made my John Paul Jones. Okay, because my notes. And I mean, I didn't mind it because I like this band, but I get that why you, this would you would hate it for this reason. It reminded me of Sticks. <laughs> it was totally a Dennis DeYoung solo. Um, <laughs> Although the solo guitar that leads into part three, this is a four part song. Um, there's this little kind of instrumental part that is basically part two. Um, reminds me of both Steve Howe and Jimmy Page. And and to hear Gerwitz, a punk guitar player, doing this was damn impressive. Right. I love their playing on it. And, uh, it's the only redeeming part of the song. But mm-hmm. and his singing, though, he can sing better than this. Yeah. That's a, I he, found that very frustrating. He was 19. <laughs> Yeah, listen to how can hell be any worse? This is the best he could do at the time. I love Graffin's voice; he's one of my favorite singers. But you know, judging from the first album, this is the best he could do at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, this could be picked for weakest. It's, it's it also, but I mean, it's tough to tell at this. Well, the the song ending, however, the the how they end the song abruptly like that hmm. with that echo back. I do look like that, but that, that's decades ahead of its time. The Every thing that, song in the in the in the zeros or early two yeah, thousands yeah. ended it that way. <laughs> but the thing that killed it for me is part three. It goes bossa nova. <laughs> I, I just I, have make it stop. I don't even see four parts being possible in this. It was well, like there was the four is the four, part four is basically a generous. return to part one. Yeah. They just return to part one with kind of looser timing. They sound a bit drunk. They get chaotic. And then it, it does have this solos that don't happen in this. Yeah. Like it's just this repetitive riff that goes on its own mm-hmm. for like a minute. You're just yeah. like, wait, is something supposed to happen here? Did they not insert something? <laughs> you know, is, was it scene missing? And then it has that sudden synth ending, uh, which yeah. I did like. Um, right. On to track five, the dichotomy. One of the, I think the only song on it that I've heard them play with Bentley and um, probably uh, probably fine soon, it probably shortly after. Yeah, you know, once the band reformed, they actually did this one live. Um, so with the keyboards and start on this, I'm like, wow, this is a year before Van Halen's 1984 came out. Mm-hmm. And then as it went on, I thought, but wait a minute, it's a year after the theme from Fame came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They weren't doing anything new, um, no. but I do like the riff, good groove. Um, the vocal rem- rem- melody reminds me a bit of Neil Young. Okay, yeah. Um, I do like where the, it picks up, except aside from the keyboard part. Um, actually, reminds me very much of VR, like their their typical sound. Yeah. Um, there's this whiny short 
keyboard solo before the second pickup that amuses me. He just hits a few notes with this really whiny sound. Yeah, just the just bad synths and sound effects. Yeah, and then they just go into these 80s synth effects towards the end. Um, I like <laughs> saying, if I know it, it should have ended minutes earlier with a gunshot like Bill Withers. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the bass tone on this. This is one of the few I can hear the bass on. Um, but I, I'm mentioning all of these different influences, and I think that's what this album did for them. Because it allowed, you know, the first one is just hardcore. This allowed right. them to bring in other influences, you know, to be prog heads and to, you know, to lean towards Young and Sticks and all of these other things. It's interesting things. to do this for a sophomore album when usually a band is trying to find its footing anyway. Well, they didn't take it seriously. They didn't think anyone would give a shit about the second album. So they just yeah. did something. They just fucked off. <laughs> right. On to track six, Million Days. The opening riff on this one, very similar to Tope, Time and Disregard, is another folky one. Right, um, they recycle <laughs> music yeah. of this album. It's kind of annoying. This one and the next one are very recycled. Um, the Again, hilariously juvenile lyrics, and the vocal is, and the melody is, is also really cheesy and juvenile. Um, this might be my pick for weakest, because yeah, there wasn't even good, good playing to really back up on it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And the lyrics are probably the absolute worst on this album. I just what love the fuck is passing a social cross the social mile. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and a million and the chorus is just the line repeated and a million days is worth one good laugh. <laughs> it's such a fucking high school song. All righty. <laughs> As someone who played in bands in high school, this is the kind of shit you wrote. <laughs> and I mean, you would think, they were doing some sort of sequencer because it was just a repetitive loop that went nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, they played that manually because mm. <laughs> it's before sequencers, isn't it? But on the positive side, I do like the guitar solo. It was nice and melodic. Um, I do like, the again, some great piano on the outro. Um, but yeah, if if this is if Time and Disregard didn't annoy me with that bossa nova section, this would have been my pick, my pick for weakest. Um, on to track seven. Losing Generation. Um, keyboard part, very similar to It's Only Over When. Um, yeah, they're using the same... Uh, uh, it's pretty much the same, yeah, the same yeah. exact keyboards from It's Only Over When. Which, I mean, if it wasn't for that keyboard part, this would probably be the strongest. It's very similar to a Bad Religion yeah, song. that's my next note, is again, without the keyboards, another case where it would sound like Bad Religion. I um, think this one pained me the least, so I'm going to pick this one as my strongest, <laughs> maybe? Uh -huh. um, I do like the groove. Um, more Styx-esque uh, keyboard solos. Um, I do like the heavily distorted guitar hits during the keyboard solo. A nice short, ragged guitar solo after the first chorus. The lyrics do kind of hint at where he's going to go. They're a little yeah. better than the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and a nice chaotic double guitar solo. He, he recorded two solos and put them next to each other. Um, <laughs> it was just nice to see Brett reveling in his guitar playing. You know, in his lead playing. Because he never does that with the band anymore. Because they're, they're so fucking economical now. Yeah. You know, it was great to hear them stretch out. And finally, track eight, You Give Up. No, the, only, the first track is called It's Only Over When... Dot, dot, dot. The last track. You Give Up. Dot, 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 you give up, yeah. Um, it's clever when you're 19. <laughs> <laughs> Kicked ass at the community college, man. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> this one starts with this nice moody piano part. Reminds me a bit of Chronophobia, one of my favorite Bad Religion songs. Um, uh, the lyrics are a bit silly, but I like the piano in the first section. Um, nice and dark and moody. And then it just turns into a faster, sloppier rehash of its only over when. It's almost, I mean, I mean I'd mean, i probably, this would probably be second favorite on the album. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's way too repetitive, though. It's kind of like a great moment of a prog song, yeah, like yeah. a fragment of one. And then uh, I like, uh, it's, you know, it's a lot like a Bad Religion song also, yeah. only they just threw these crazy Rick Wakeman-esque keyboards yeah, yeah, in it, towards the end. The whole thing just gets drowned out by a keyboard solo, and they just, again, sound drunk, and it devolves into chaos. 
it's like the same keyboards that Wakeman used in Perpetual Change mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of that. And it's just only a couple seconds he used them too, uh -huh. but they like just ran with them here. So, of course, I have to ask, and I think I know, <laughs> would you recommend it? This is the um, Star Wars Holiday Special of Bad Religion <laughs> albums. Very much, it, very much. It's a great analogy because, you know, I hear you know, the story of Carrie Fisher saying she would put it on when she wants guests to leave a party. <laughs> um, I like Bad Religion. I like Progressive Rock. There are a lot of comments on YouTube of like, you know, people that didn't like it because they were more punk than now. Mm -hmm. I also like butterscotch and I like pizza. <laughs> and the two just don't go together. Uh -huh. um, so no, no, I would not recommend this one. This one, I've known about this one for a few years. I've listened to it a lot. It's grown on me. Um, and I do recommend it if you're a BR fan. Um, although if you are, you're in for something. And, well, if you're one of the few who somehow hasn't heard it yet. If you're a bad religion fan, you know this album, you know what to expect. But if you haven't, go in expecting something different. If nothing else, it's worth it as a curiosity. I, that's exactly what I was going to say. It is a curiosity, uh, much like the very first Genesis album yeah. that's pre-Phil Collins, mm -hmm. <laughs> when they're in high school, too. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how they develop their sound. But if you're looking for... A bad religion album don't don't go here no 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 it's it, it's very very different um and oh. that's it for into the unknown until next time when we'll be reviewing Bui kikaisu by maximum the hormone another band i can't wait for you to hear um always remember never forget wherever you go in life there you are there you are <laughs>